Good afternoon, Joshua Gordon, uh, Dr. Joshua Gordon, uh, Associate Professor of Psychiatry at uh, University of Columbia School of Medicine. Did I get that right, Josh? You got that right. All right, great. Uh, so you, you're a, um, a, a also a winner of the IMRO Rising Star Research Award in 2010. So welcome to Brainwaves. Thank you, Brandon. And congratulations on the award. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that award uh, first. Um, and uh, so your award that you won was for your proposal to uh, do some research and investigate on the circuit basis, malfun how malfunctions and circuits in the brain can lead to symptoms of mood disorders, such as, say, bipolar disorder, or um, cognitive disorders, alternatively, um, such as schizophrenia. And can you please tell us a bit about how uh, the Emerald Award has helped you to achieve uh, some new things in those areas? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's helped in a lot of different ways. Um, our research is aimed at um, understanding the link between the genes which cause psychiatric disorders and the symptoms they cause by attacking uh, the, the, the specific neural circuits that, uh, that the genes alter and that are responsible for behavior. Um, the IMRO award has allowed us to, for example, purchase equipment that we need to be able to monitor simultaneously, uh, you know, many channels of neural information, so many parts of the brain all at once, uh, while the animals are behaving. And that allows us to then make uh, what we think are strong conclusions about the relationship between specific patterns of neural activity and specific behaviors uh, and how they're disrupted by these genes. So one very practical way is we've been able to buy the equipment necessary to improve our capacity uh, to do that. Um, I've also been able to support the, the, the students and postdocs in my lab uh, uh, who, have, um, who have been engaged in this research. And uh, perhaps most importantly, the support for those students and postdocs has enabled us to get the preliminary data that we need to, um, to then submit, and we're fortunate enough to get funded uh, some federal grants that, that are uh, particularly um, supporting our work on a, on a genetic model of schizophrenia. And we've been struggling to get those grants for a few years, and the IMRO support was really instrumental in in kicking us over the threshold uh, for sufficient data to prove our, 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 uh, that our hypotheses are reasonable and worth testing. Awesome. Great. Um, can you give any examples of like things you've discovered relevant to the pathophysiology of circuit malfunctions in, in mood disorders or cognitive disorders uh, briefly uh, with the MRO funding? Sure. Uh, for, for the moment, the most progress, well, we've made progress in two different areas. And both of these, uh, I should say in advance that both of the things that I'm going to mention now are not yet published. We're submitting them now. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, while we're very confident in the results, it's, it's still a little early. Uh, but uh, one of the things that we've done in the realm of, um, of affective disorders is we've been studying the role of relationships in activity between brain regions in anxiety and depression. And in particular, in, on the anxiety front, we've made some recent headway. One of my postdocs, uh, who is, uh, whose work is partially supported by IMRO, uh, uh, Katya Liktik, has been studying the uh, relationship of activity in uh, the amygdala and prefrontal cortex to brain regions that have been implicated in uh, anxiety behaviors. But we're the first to actually really examine the dynamics of the behavior, of the neural activity in those two brain regions uh, online during behavior. And, uh, and she's shown that what happens uh, when animals gain control, if you will, over their anxiety. So if you can teach an animal to be afraid, for example, of, of, of a sound. And, um, and you can then teach the animal that that sound is nothing to be afraid of. And what we find... Uh, is that as the animal becomes uh, uh, accustomed to the previously uh, to the sound that used to be um, uh, anxiety provoking, um, and the prefrontal cortex activity 
uh, squelches activity in the amygdala, and we can see that happening online. We can see the directional switch so initially when the uh, when the uh, sound signals something to be afraid of. The amygdala drives prefrontal activity, and then when the animal learns that the sound is nothing to be afraid of, the prefrontal activity uh, uh, drives the amygdala activity. So what we're seeing online in the animal's brain is a fight between uh, a fear center, the amygdala, and a control center, uh, the prefrontal cortex. Um, and this fight has been hypothesized and actually indirectly shown to occur uh, using various tools. Um, but we can actually see that online and that's uh, due in no small part because of the, uh, uh, the capacity we've, we've built uh, to do that uh, with the IMRO funds. That's really um, cool. Um, yeah. And, and I, I bet that, you know, pretty soon you'll be able to, or other scientists who you work with or learn about your work will be able to apply some of that directionality knowledge between the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex perhaps to intervene somehow with a pharmaceutical or, or other intervention to maybe help improve the symptoms of anxiety disorders? Right, so that's actually our next step is to intervene in that directionality by trying to influence the balance between these two structures and see if that can change activity. And if we can show that we can do that in an animal model, then we can look for ways that we could translate that into humans. Awesome. Congratulations. Thanks. Yeah. So, um, so not only are you a, a, a neuroscientist who works with mice, but you're also a psychiatrist who works with human patients. And um, I have a couple of questions about that. Uh, that and that's, I really admire your, your fortitude and, and dedication in, in pursuing those two directions simultaneously in your career. But, uh, you know, what, what motivates you to, to do both at one time? And how has your experience in each kind of informed the other? Uh, well, the motivation is really easy. I uh, enjoy and value both tremendously. Um, working with patients is, uh, gives you a, a, a connection uh, to, to the individual patients and also to the endeavor of trying to, to heal people, which is tremendously rewarding um, and uh, and so uh, it, it you know it, it feels wonderful to be engaged in in that kind of a tightly personal endeavor um, in, in trying to help uh, individuals with psychiatric disorders uh, get better um, and then from a research perspective uh, um, the rewards are as tremendous they they take a little bit longer to, to obtain um, but uh, you know, I'm really uh, 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 an intellectually curious person and trying to figure out how the brain creates behavior and how that goes awry in psychiatric illness is a tremendously intellectually satisfying problem to work on. So I, I, uh, the motivation is simply that I enjoy both and I couldn't imagine life without doing either one of them. So I, I sort of have to do both. Um, the, <laughs> The, and then the second question you asked, I think, was um, how, how, how one feet. How does your experience in each kind of help you inform the other? Do you, there, can you have, do you have any examples of that? Yeah, I can give you one uh, specific example. I have a patient that I work with who has schizophrenia. And her life has been tremendously impacted by the disease, as have uh, many lives. Um, she's fortunate in that the medications do work for her very well. And they control her um, psychotic symptoms, her hallucinations and delusions. Um, and, but unfortunately, um, she's left with significant cognitive symptoms that um, have been very resilient to all kinds of forms of treatment, be it medication or uh, cognitive rehabilitation therapy and, and, uh, and, and, and other forms. So, um, you know, there's a, a, a tremendous motivator for me to get involved with trying to understand uh, how cognition is disrupted in schizophrenia because we know so little about that that it makes it very difficult to, for us to design any kind of treatments. Um, so that's an example of how the clinical world influences my research. Uh, as yet, there's no, the, 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 the influence that my research has over my clinical practice is it, it gives me a different language to speak with patients. Um, so, for example, in my anxiety disorder patients, which I have several, I can talk to them about how their amygdala and prefrontal cortex aren't, aren't working in the way that would be ideal and, 
and that when we try to help them um, through various you know, cognitive behavioral therapeutic techniques or through medication, when we try to help reduce their anxiety, what we're trying to do is give them control, give their prefrontal cortex control over their amygdala. And not every patient um, appreciates that kind of discussion, but the ones that do, I'm able to really help them conceptualize what's going on in, in their brains, and I think it, 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 helps, uh, it helps them deal with the disorder. So I, there is some back and forth. And, and I really do enjoy the back and forth as well. Good, good. Um, can you, um, well, we also know that, um, you know, unfortunately, government funding for research and also for healthcare, um, it has been de decreasing of late, um, but also uh, there have been some great discoveries being made nonetheless, uh, which you've, dis uh, you've discovered some yourself. Um, would you say that you're overall, um, overall, would you say you're more concerned or more hopeful about the future of neuroscience at this point? I'm definitely more hopeful. Um, I think, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful because the science is really in an unparalleled position to be able to make some significant breakthroughs in, in, in the, um, in the, what I would consider near term in the next five, five or 10 years. I think, the science, we're learning so much about how the brain works that it puts us in a wonderful position. Um, budgetary problems, which we are, you know, rife with in, in this uh, tight economic times, will, yes, yeah, set us back. And so that's a cause for concern, and we should do everything we can to try to um, expand the opportunities to fund research. But, um, but the science is in a really wonderful position right now, and I think that, that gives me a lot of cause for optimism. Excellent. Good. Good. And then, uh, what would you say are some of the best reasons for hope for people with mental illness uh, today? Well, I would go back to that science, and I would, yeah. uh, you know, I from interacting with patients uh, every week in my practice, I, I know that uh, that a lot for a lot of them, it's very hard to have that kind of hope. Um, but uh, but I try to instill in them the idea that you know. Uh, there's always hope around the corner. And, and like I said, the science, the neuroscience of psychiatric illness is really accelerating dramatically. Um, and I, I mean, I, I, I think we're not that there yet, but in the world of cancer, when you're diagnosed with, uh, with cancer these days, they give you, you know, um, statistics, survival statistics that were based upon people getting diagnosed five years ago, and they're already wrong, right? There's such a fast pace of advancement in cancer treatment that for many types of cancers people are living much longer today than they were two or three or four years ago with the same diagnosis. Uh -huh. uh, and so I, I think we're not at the point where our, the pace of psychiatric treatment is that fast. But I think with the knowledge explosion we have, I think that we will be there soon. We will soon be uh, helping people in, uh, you know, in three or four years uh, the, in, with, in ways that we, that we um, could not have imagined three or four years ago. And I think that's, uh, that's a very hopeful thought. Definitely. Thanks for doing uh, work in that field and for you know, helping drive that forward. And um, you're an amazing source of inspiration for me and hope for many people out there. Um, now, uh, once I post this video, um, some people will want to ask you some questions probably. Uh, are you ready to answer some questions when they post them? Absolutely. Okay, great. Thanks, Josh. Sure. Uh, thanks for appearing on Brainwaves, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.